Hello everybody and welcome to what is going to be our last example of a matched sample design. We've gone through a simple one-tail test, a one-tail test with a hypothesized value different from zero. Now, just for complete, completeness, we're going to do a two-tail test. Now, let's, again, like always, let's go through the problem and make sure that we can understand why it's a two-tail test because normally, of course, you're not going to be told. You probably won't even be told that it's a matched sample. So we should also probably be able to make sure that we can identify that it's a matched sample by reading the clues, by reading the information contained in the problem. Okay. So retail gasoline outlets frequently advertise the benefits of their fuel additives in maintaining a clean, smooth running engine. However, there's some disagreement on whether or not it affects the fuel efficiency. So, you know, those additives that they always adver uh, advertise as cleaning your engine while you drive. Does it affect fuel efficiency? In order to determine if the additive affects fuel efficiency, one chain of gas stations measured fuel efficiency of five cars without the additive, then again with the additive. And then the following table contains their data. Now, when, when we look at this table of data, we can probably see fairly clearly that it's a match sample design, right? Because when I look at this table, well, here I can see, okay, I've got five cars. Here's their fuel efficiency without the additive. Here it is with the additive. So by just looking at the table, I can identify it as a match sample because I have two data points, right? Two data points for each experimental unit. So for the fourth car, I have two data points, right? And so on for each of those cars. So I can tell by looking at the sample that it's a matched sample design. Also, a dead giveaway is that these difference values have been given to us. That's also a pretty strong clue. You're lucky if on an exam or something, you're lucky if you've got that much detail given to you. Normally, I don't think you would have those differences. Your sample might only be those first three columns. So looking at that table, we've definitely got some clues as to what kind of problem we're working with. But even reading the question, it tells us how the data has been collected, right? It tells us here that the, this one gas station measured the fuel efficiency of, oops, of five cars, five cars with the additive, then again, or without the additive, then again with the additive. So it's not telling us that they have five cars that they have the additive and another five cars with the additive, right? We don't have 10 cars. We have five cars that they first gave it with the additive, then again without. So they're explaining how the data has been collected and that as well points us towards setting this up as a matched sample. So I'm just going to put in my notation here because that notation tells me that we're working with uh, a matched sample design. So what kind of test is it going to be? Well, now again, I've got to go through the problem and try to figure out some clues here, right? There's there's some disagreement on whether or not it affects fuel efficiency. In order to determine if the additive uh, has an effect on fuel efficiency, we've gone ahead and gathered this data. So it's asking us, or the, the statement is simply whether or not it affects fuel efficiency, not whether or not it has a positive effect or a negative effect, just whether or not there's an effect, whether or not there's a difference in fuel efficiency, having the additive or not having the additive. One could easily argue that, you know, we want to test it for a negative impact, or maybe we want to test it for a positive impact. Perhaps either of those two options would also make sense. But when I read the problem, I am only going to formulate my test based on what's stated in the problem, not what I think it should be but based on what is being done and based on what is being said. So I am going to set this up as a two-tailed test to see whether it has any impact at all on fuel efficiency. So again, I don't have any magnitude of an impact, just 
whether it has an impact, yes or no. We're doing this at the 5% level of significance. And that's it. Now we can go forward with the rest of our test. Next step then, calculator test statistic. So this is again, quite similar to what we've seen before. We're basically, you know, it looks very much like just a simple module nine type single population test. And this is that sample, right? Because once we have calculated those difference values, we don't need this stuff anymore. All of our testing is done on those values. I want to point out one more thing here just before I forget. On the previous match sample problems, I spent a little bit of time talking about how those difference values were calculated. And I used that to define my populations as population one, population two. I did that in those problems again because they were one tail tests. And so it really mattered. When we're doing a two-tail test, it is somewhat less consequential how we define those populations. And when I set up my test here, it's just mu d. I don't even have a population one or two in that test. Definitely, we always want to make sure that it's clear how those difference values are calculated. But when I just look at my test, it's not entirely clear, right? I, I might be inclined to say mu d is the, the width minus the without. And certainly if this were an exam problem and I had to calculate those difference values, absolutely, I would make sure to write how those different values are being calculated. And that's especially important on those one tail tests. But again, for two tail tests, it's not as crucial because all it will do is give us either a negative or a positive test statistic. It won't change the results at all. Okay, so here I have D bar, my hypothesized difference and that standard error. D bar, once again, I'm not gonna go through these kind of time consuming calculations. It's just the average of those values. So here I know that D bar is going to be minus two. And then S, S again, that's my sample standard deviation. I won't go through the time consuming calculation. We did that when we already covered that in the earlier, much earlier videos. So here I have that standard deviation is 1.87. We'll keep it to three decimal places just in case. Okay, and now I have my test statistic. This is 1871 over the square root of just five. All right, remember, because that's our sample, we're just working with the differences. It's not five plus five. Nope, I don't even need that stuff anymore. It's just five. So here our test statistic is going to be 
2 divided by 1.871 divided by root 5 and that gives me negative 2.39. But at this point, everybody's just kind of chugging along, right? You're one step ahead of me. Our degrees of freedom, n minus 1, I've only got 5, so our degrees of freedom here is just 4. I can scroll down to my t distribution. I'm looking at just 4 degrees of freedom. And I'm looking for my test statistic. Let me just verify 239, whoops, 239, good. And so here I am here. Yes, my test statistic was negative. Does it matter? No, T distribution is perfectly symmetric. I'm not concerned about the sign, right? All the more reason why for a two-tailed test, it's not as important how you define your terms or how you calculate those difference values. It should always be clear how it's calculated, but it doesn't change all that much. So 239 and between these values, 0.025 and 0 0.05, 0 0.05 and 0 0.025. And everybody right away says, ah, we gotta reject. But again, you know, I intentionally make the same mistake all the time. Yes, it's intentional, I know. You think I am actually making the mistake. But no, because it's such a common mistake, and I hate to see students lose marks for this. This is, again, a two-tailed test. You go through, right? You've heard me say this so many times. You go through the pattern, the process, Time constraint, you're stressed, you're under a lot of pressure, and you draw your conclusion and you move on to the next problem. And you forget that a two-tailed test, you need to multiply those values by two. So our p-value is not between 0.05 and 0.025. Our p-value is actually between 0.1 and 0.05. And again, this is one of those examples where that mistake makes all the difference in the world. Because now, that p-value is greater than my level of significance. Do not reject. We've done some examples where forgetting to double it, you know, didn't make a big difference. Because the p-value is already high, and so you're already maybe not going to reject it. Doubling it meant you're still not going to reject it. But there's certainly situations like this where if you forget to double it, it's the difference between the right conclusion and the wrong conclusion. And the, the type of conclusion that you come to, of course, that's going to influence everything, your interpretation and any action that must be taken as a result of that conclusion. It has an enormous impact. So make sure that you don't forget what kind of test you're doing. Because here, we do not reject the null hypotheses, which means we have insufficient evidence to show that there is any impact on average fuel efficiency from the use of this additive. Okay, we're unable to show that the use of this additive has any impact on average fuel efficiency. So that's it, we've got our p-value, we threw in a critical value for good measure, and our interpretation. Let's just bonus marks, bonus question. Let's throw in a confidence interval. Because again, it's nice to see, you know, both the confidence interval in itself as an interval estimate, but also, you know, we have the opportunity here to see how it's consistent with that two-tailed test. Now, a confidence interval for a match sample, it's, it's entirely the same, right? When we were looking at single population intervals back in module nine, you had something that looked like this, right? That T alpha with however many degrees of freedom and that standard error. 
The only thing that changes now is that instead of an X bar, I'm going to put a D bar. But really, that doesn't change anything, right? It's just a notation because now we're looking at an average difference. And so here that's going to be negative 2 plus or minus that critical value. No, oh, we didn't find a critical value. My mistake. I thought we did. Let's come back down here. Here's our critical value, 4 degrees of freedom, 0.025. There's 0.025. So our critical value here is 2.776. Plus or minus 2.776. And our standard error, we had this was 1.871 over square root of 5. Negative 2 is that point estimate. Let's get that standard error. 2.776, 1.871, divided by root 5. So this is 2.32. So then our upper and lower limits, well, this is going to be 0 0.32, and this is going to be minus 4.32. So we're 95% confident because again, that's a 95% interval. 95% confident that the true difference in the average fuel efficiency with or without the additive is between minus 4.3 and plus 0.32. What does this mean? Well, zero exists within that interval the fact that our hypothesized value exists within that interval, that is consistent with a failure to reject that null, right? And so again, when we don't reject the null, I'm not saying I have evidence to show that the average is zero. I'm saying I have an insufficient evidence to say to show that it's not zero, right? Our evidence does not support the alternative. Our evidence here, it doesn't say that it is equal to zero. It says I'm unable to say that it's different from zero. I know that sounds tedious and cumbersome, but when we look at that interval, I'm 95% confident that the true difference in fuel efficiency with and without the additive is between negative 4.32 and positive 3.2. The fact that our hypothesized value is possible, that is why we are unable to reject the null. I'm not saying it is zero, I'm saying I'm unable to say it's not zero. Tedious, I know. But that's the consistency. That's how we can compare that interval with that test. Okay, that little bonus question of a confidence interval went on a little longer than I meant. But there it is. Hope that was helpful. Thanks for watching.